Hello everyone, and welcome to the online recording of my thesis defense. Before I begin, I would like to acknowledge my thesis committee members. The committee chair, my research advisor and professor, Dr. Wolfram Laub, from the Department of Medical Physics, another of my professors, Susha Pillai, who is also from Medical Physics, an advisor from the OSU-OHSU Joint Department of Pharmacy, Dr. Anna Brown, and an OSU Graduate School Council representative, Dr. Conroy Soon, who is also from the Department of Pharmacy. This thesis defense is part of the requirements I need to fulfill in order to receive a Master of Science degree in medical physics. Today, I will be talking about simulating dose enhancement effects of platinum nanoparticles in a spherical geometry with Monte Carlo. I will start the presentation by giving you an introduction of my topic. I will then provide you with some background, give a brief explanation of the code I used for the simulations, and share my findings along with their potential clinical significance. Finally, I will outline my suggestion for further research in this topic. The radiation dose enhancement properties of high Z nanoparticles have been a hot topic in research for over a decade and has been subject to computer simulations as well as in vitro and in vivo studies. Of the high Z elements, gold nanoparticles are the most popular. However, the purpose of this thesis was to develop and run Monte Carlo code simulations to study the radiation enhancement properties of platinum nanoparticles. Now I will talk about some background information about nanoparticles, photon matter interactions, radiation dose enhancement, the Monte Carlo method, and percent depth dose. First, I'd like to talk about what a nanoparticle is and what it means to have a high Z number. A nanoparticle is simply a very small particle we're talking nanometers in diameter. Nanoparticles have a wide range of applications in medicine beyond what is discussed in my thesis. The Z number of an element is the number of orbiting electrons a neutral atom of that element has. A few examples of high Z non-toxic elements include platinum, gold, and bismuth. Fun fact, bismuth is one of the main ingredients in Pepto-Bismol. There are three main types of interactions between ionizing photons and atoms, the photoelectric effect, Compton scatter, and pair production. At relatively low photon energies, which include kilovoltage energies, the probability of photons and atoms interacting via the photoelectric effect dominates by an order of magnitude of three or greater, and is proportional to the Z number of the target atom cubed over the energy of the photon cubed. In addition, since pair production requires photons of 1.02 MeV or greater to even be possible, no pair production occurs at the lower energies. So this type of interaction may simply be ignored. The context book provides a graphic that summarizes the photoelectric effect. As we can see, the incident photon gets completely absorbed by the target atom and an electron is freed from the inner case shell. This freed electron is known as a photoelectron, which is shown in green. The kinetic energy of these photoelectrons is the total energy of the incoming photon minus the binding energy between it and the atom. With the low energy photons used for the simulations, the maximum range of the photoelectrons is on the order of microns. After the ejection of the photoelectron, there is a vacancy in the case shell of the atom. To fill this vacancy, an electron from an outer shell will drop down to the case shell, which causes an excess of energy in the atom. To return to equilibrium, the atom will either emit a character X-ray, as seen in orange, or eject an OJ electron, seen in blue. Since the energy of the OJ electron is only the difference in binding energies between the K shell and the outer shell, it will have a much lower kinetic energy than the photoelectron and thus a range on the order of nanometers. Many of us have seen this graph before. This graph represents which processes dominate given the Z number of the absorbing material and the energy of the interacting photons. 
Here I will demonstrate graphically the dominance of the photoelectric effect over Compton scatter. 20 keV photons were used in these simulations, which is indicated here with a red line. As we can see, most of the line lies in the photoelectric dominant region of the graph. In order to further capitalize on this dominance, we want to select nanoparticles composed of high Z elements as the probability of the photoelectric effect occurring is highly dependent on the Z number of the absorber. Of course, the materials can't have too high a Z number as they become toxic to humans and eventually radioactive. As previously mentioned, the most common high Z materials used in nanoparticle dose enhancement research are platinum, gold, and bismuth. Using these elements puts us well within the photoelectric dominant zone. Given the same low energy photons, the increasing, increasing the Z number of the medium with which the photons encounter increases the probability that the photoelectric effect will occur. More instances of the photoelectric effect occurring in the same volume means more radiation doses deposited in that volume. Due to the relatively short range of the photo and OJ electrons, this enhancement of dose will be mostly confined to the volume in which the high Z nanoparticles are located. Before proceeding, it should be noted that there is some contention in the scientific community as to the extent at which high Z nanoparticles enhance radiation dose at MB range energies. While mathematical models as well as studies involving computer simulations show enhancement on the order of only about a percent, in vitro and in vivo studies have indirectly shown a more significant dose enhancement in the form of increased tumor cell killing. The reasons for this are still in under investigation. So why were platinum nanoparticles chosen for this study? As mentioned before, GMPs are the gold standard in high Z nanoparticle dose enhancement research. There are relatively few articles on the other elements, namely platinum and bismuth. Platinum was chosen for its higher density yet relatively similar Z number. In addition, PMPs contain about 12% uh, more atoms than GNPs of the same size. One of the objectives of this study was to examine the potential effect of density of the atom may have on dose enhancement. Percent depth dose curves were used as the metric for comparison in this study. PDD curves are a one-dimensional way of evaluating dose distribution, with depth being the independent variable and dose being the dependent variable. As seen in the graph, oops, as seen in the graph, each PDD curve shows, each PDD curve follows a roughly exponential decay trend, which is anticipated with mathematical modeling. Two things the exponential decay model do not account for, however, are the inverse square law, which does not apply to PDDs anyway because the depth dose distribution is one dimensional in the direction of the x-rays, and scatter, which does contribute to PDDs in the form of forward, back, and side scatter. PDD values are found by taking the ratio of the measured dose at depth D and the dose measured at D max, which is where the absolute maximal dose occurs. Notice here that the cobalt-60 and higher energy beams have a buildup region. This is a characteristic of higher energy beams. Lower energy beams, like the ones used in my simulations, do not have this feature, so Dmax is at a depth of zero. A bug in the user code prompted an investigation as to what happens to the radiation dose at the interface between high and low Z media. This in an investigation included both the interface effects from low to high Z and the interface effects from high to low Z. Although only the high to low Z interface would be shown in the main simulations. This investigation served the additional purpose of qualitatively evaluating the accuracy of the user code at interfaces. Here we have a PDD curve for a beam with an approximate energy of 80 keV. The blue PDD curve is only for soft tissue, while the red dashed curve includes a layer of bone located at some depth. This figure shows the general trend only and does not include subtle dose perturbation effects such as backscatter, forward scatter, or buildup. 
which will be described momentarily. Regardless of the interface, the general effect, that is, increase or decrease in dose at the interface, can be approximated with the mathematical model. And the basic equation for radiation dose is the photon fluence, which is assumed to be the same before and after the interface, the energy for each photon, which again is the same before and after the interface, and the mass energy absorption coefficient, which is dependent on the absorbing material as well as the energy of the photons interacting with said medium. After some simple math, it can be approximated that the ratio of the dose before and after the interface is equal to the ratio of the respective mass energy absorption coefficients. In short, Mathematical modeling predicts that PDD sharply increases at the low to high Z interface and sharply decreases at the high to low Z interface. In addition, dose perturbation effects due to buildup are not a factor for low energies. There are additional perturbations to the dose in the low Z medium at the interface due to scatter. Backscattered secondary electrons will deposit their energy in, in a small region upstream to the low to high Z interface. The size of this region depends on the energy of the incident photons as well as the higher energy photons produce longer range along. Oh my gosh. The size of this region depends on the energy of the incident photons as higher energy photons produce longer range secondary electrons. Similarly, there, are, there will be a slight perturbation after the high to low Z interface due to the forward scattered secondary electrons in combination with buildup. The last bit of background to cover is a brief description of what the Monte Carlo method is. Essentially, the Monte Carlo method takes a bunch of individual event tracks and combines them into a big picture. For, each, for, for example, the path of a single photon's journey from creation at the source to its eventual interaction with some particle to secondary electron creation to energy deposition, deposition is predicted given input probabilities. Many simulations follow the paths of single photons and the secondary electrons produced and the average scenario is predicted. This results in an accurate probability-based model to predict what happens when photons interact with nanoparticles. It follows that running more simulations leads to more accurate data. There are two general types of Monte Carlo simulations used to calculate radiation dose, analog simulations and condensed history simulations. Analog simulations involve four steps. The first step is to select the distance to the next interaction. This calculation combines the probability distribution of how, how far the simulated particle can travel with the random number generator, which selects the distance from the probability distribution. Next, a simple ray trace from the particle's origin to its destination is done while accounting for the geometry through which the simulated particle travels. Next, selecting the interaction type involves another probability distribution and random number generator. Lastly, the interaction at the particle's destination is simulated, which takes into account probabilities for energy loss, direction of the secondary particles, and other factors. The steps are repeated until the particle either leaves, the, leaves or is absorbed by the geometry. And each run through the steps is known as one history. Analog simulations are conceptually simple to understand, but they are impractical to run due to the sheer number of histories required to have statistically significant results. To compensate for this, condensed history simulations group small effect interactions together into single histories. Of course, grouping too many events together results in artifacts. However, computing power and affordability today allows for smaller groupings and thus much more accurate simulations. All right, this is the end of part one.